Okay, uh, hi everyone. Um, I am Donnie Farber. For uh, those that don't know me, uh, let me quickly introduce myself and kick off the call. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I think Steve's on mute now, but let me, let me continue. Okay, so um, I'm sorry about that, um, but I am a member of the KLS uh, Foundation Board. Steve Mayer is with me as well. He's also um, a board member. He is, uh, he's our president. In addition to um, being an active member with the foundation, I'm also a former KLS uh, patient. Um, I am, uh, I've had um, 17 episodes over a 10 year period from age um, 15 to 25. And um, I'll say that those years were very challenging and traumatic. Uh, period of time for both me and my family, my parents um, who helped build the KLS Foundation. They were unwilling to, uh, you know, sit and just watch me suffer, and so they went seeking for a medical researcher who would be willing to take on this mysterious illness that was robbing me of my adolescence. And that's when we found Dr. Emmanuel Mignot uh, nearly 20 years ago. Uh, since that time, uh, the KLS Foundation and, um, and Dr. Mignot and his research lab at Stanford have had a very important partnership. Uh, Dr. Mignot has led uh, not all uh, KLS research, but a lot of our most important work on KLS. And, um, and that's why we're here today. To, uh, we thought it'd be a good idea to facilitate this connectivity between Dr. Mignot and the other researchers at his lab. We're also joined with Dr. Andrea goldstein Tukarski, um, and, and all of you, uh, the KLS community. So with that, um, what we thought we'd do is give a chronological overview of Dr. Mignot's research. Um, we'd start with a look back that gives a background of his early work. Um, to where we are today. Um, Dr. Mignot recently uh, published some very exciting um, research on a genetic study that he did. Uh, it was a paper that concluded a 14 year study um, that was called uh, a genome wide association study. So he'll get into what that was all about and the findings there. And then finally, um, where do we want to go from here? Um, the KLS uh, Research Fund, the KLS Foundation and Stanford are currently working on two new research initiatives um, called the Actigraphy Study and the Proteomics Study. And so Dr. Mignot and Dr. Goldstein Tukarski will speak about those and, um, and discuss, you know, explain what those are about and how we all can get involved in, and participate. And then finally, Steve and I will moderate a Q&A. Uh, we asked in advance for you to send in your questions. We've received a bunch of those and gone through them. Um, if you have questions that you'd like to ask, you can also put them in the chat room. And then while Dr. Mignot and, uh, and Dr. goldstein Pekarski are speaking, we can, we can sort through those as well. So with that, um, let's get started. Before I hand the call over to them, let me just quickly, uh, you know, formally introduce them. Like I said, Dr. Mignot has been working hand in hand with the KLS Foundation for nearly 20 years now. He is um, a leading researcher globally in sleep disorders. He um, has had a distinguished career at Stanford University. He is a professor of sleep medicine. And his claim to fame is that he discovered the cause for narcolepsy. And so um, in addition to um, in addition to the KLS, uh, he's, in addition, he has initiated KLS uh, research. And so he is working on that as well. Um, I will say that he has 
not only initiated this work, but he's made real progress in it. And the reason I'm saying that is because I'm sure a lot of us on this call, you know, we all, myself included, we all want this big bang immediate research result that, you know, immediately finds the cause and cure for KLS. But the reality is, is that a scientific research project, um, it is a long process that often has, you know, more failures than successes. So simply put, you know, it's very par for the course to have, you know, a research take many years. And we as a foundation are very fortunate to have the persistence of Dr. Mignot and uh, in his lab on our side. Um, quickly, Dr. Andrea goldstein Pekarski. Um, she is also uh, a professor at the Sleep Center at Stanford University. She is a newer member um, of KLS researchers. She is currently the principal investigator of uh, our actigraphy study that we have initiated. And then finally, I don't want to overlook Mateo Lopez. He's also on the call. He works uh, closely with Dr. Mignot and Dr. goldstein Pekarski. He is the clinical uh, and neuroimaging research coordinator at the lab at Stanford. And he has been working uh, with them to actively enroll new patients in these two research initiatives. And so as Dr. Mignot and Dr. Uh, goldstein Pekarski speak about how we can all participate, uh, he may be the person that we're told to, to uh, potentially interface with. And so with that, Dr. Mignot, I'm ready to hand the call over to you. Thank you very much for carving out the time to speak with us. We are all very grateful. And, uh, and with that, it's all yours. Sorry, thank you so much, Danny. It's very nice to see a lot of familiar faces here. Um, some of them hidden. Uh, but uh, I recognize their name, so they can't really hide from me. Uh, it is true that I've been working for many years with the KLS uh, Foundation, and I've always enjoyed working with you all, and, and as well as trying to help patients, uh, as I realize this is a very difficult uh, disorder. So first, I am going to talk to you a little bit about what, what we have done over the years, and I think it will give you a little bit of a uh, of an idea of how we have progress in our knowledge of, of, of uh, klein levin syndrome. So let me share. Oh, I am uh, disabled for sharing. So someone needs to give me the authorization for sharing my slides. Okay, that's working now. I can tell that. Uh, do you see my screen now? We do. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good, good, okay. Okay, so, so first, I mean, I, I, I don't know if you realize, but, you know, Klein-Levin syndrome was really defined uh, in 1925 and 1936 by these two uh, physicians, you know, from uh, Germany, and uh, it was mostly recognized as, a, as a, this periodic uh, sleep that would occur, you know, on and off, you know, and be associated also with this additional symptoms, uh, which were stressed a lot at the time of, uh, you know, irritability, um, being uh, 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 eating enormous amount of food, hyperphagia, as well as sexual disinhibition. But as you will see, as we started to study more the, the syndrome, maybe some of these things even so they look sensational, may not always be the most consistent across the, symptom, the syndrome. Uh, another finding that was made before we really started to work on Klein Levin syndrome was done by Yves Dauvillier in 2002. He suggested that maybe Klein Levin syndrome uh, uh, was an autoimmune disorder. And the reason he had found this in this very small study he had found an association with a gene that's also associated with narcolepsy and is associated with autoimmune disease that's called HLA. So when we really started this, uh, you know, uh, study, uh, we, what was known is that maybe there were an autoimmune uh, basis of, of Klein-Levin syndrome, maybe uh, an infection would trigger the symptoms. And very often, as you know, 
people have flu-like symptoms, and then maybe something would happen that would attack the brain, and then maybe you would develop Klein-Levin syndrome, which is in fact what happened for narcolepsy, but probably not for Klein-Levin syndrome. And I was very lucky because uh, in 2005, uh, 2004, you know, the, the Klein uh, Levin Foundation, Syndrome Foundation, Kedas Foundation, funded uh, one of my partner in crime, which is called Isabelle Arnuf, who is now a big professor in France. Uh, and she visited, uh, she's a neurologist, and she visited for a year and uh, decided uh, with me to study on um, Klein Levin syndrome. And that really, I, I would say, launched the entire program because she was, she, she was very amazing. Uh, so first thing she did, we did together, was to review everything that was written about Klein-Levin syndrome. And that was not a simple task, you know, there were like 186 cases in the literature. And what we found is we found, you know, about uh, 168 cases. Uh, what we, we found by reviewing is that the key was really not that much all this sexual disinhibition and increased eating that was a little sensationalized, but much more the cognitive abnormalities that people during hypersomnia, when they sleep this long period of time during the episodes, not only they sleep all the time, but they are not normal. They just feel like they're in a fog. They don't really feel normal. And they are like almost mute, and they are they are just not just sleeping all the time. They also can't sing straight. Um, another thing that we found is that there were sometimes precipitating factors such as in some uh, infection, head trauma, alcohol, but nothing was very clear. We also uh, confirmed that the disease usually dis, uh, uh, disappears with age, but however it seemed to last about eight years as a median, which means that after eight years, about 50% of cases had no more uh, KLS after being followed up. And then when we analyze all the treatment, it's the only drug that seems to report some positive effect was lithium when compared to no treatment. So another thing that we discovered at the time is there were a lot of cases that had been reported in Israel so we were very excited because we thought that maybe there were what's called a Jewish uh, funding effect, as maybe some of you don't know, but uh, the, especially the Ashkenazi uh, Jewish population has uh, really um, come from a very small population, a bottleneck, what we call probably a small population, about uh, 20,000, I can't remember, I think it's uh, many thousand e of years ago, and then suddenly increased dramatically, so that they are all descendant from a relatively small population. And as a consequence, there are certain genetic disorders that are more common in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. So because of this finding of a lot of cases that were reported in Israel, and most of them were Ashkenazi, we had the idea that maybe in this initial population of, of, uh, of Ashkenazis, many, many thousands of years ago, maybe one person had genetic predisposition for KLS and everybody was a uh, descendant of that person. And that gave us a lot of hope for finding a genetic cause of narcolepsy, of uh, Klein-Levin syndrome. So we, uh, uh, the next thing we did is we really tried to collect a lot of patients and try to understand also if this finding of HLA was true and also that had been reported, this autoimmune ideas that has been reported initially, as I showed you by Dovillier, and also try to see if indeed uh, there were a predominance of the Jewish population. And that was published in 2008. We found a lot of patients all over, you know, the US. And one thing that we found that was completely unexpected, we had very long questionnaire, which was very uh, frustrating for some patients, but we asked all kinds of things. And there's one thing that came up that was very surprising is that as you see, a lot of patients, about a quarter, reported that they had very difficult births like, or developmental delay initially just after birth. Like for example, some anoxia, a very long labor, a prematurity, some problem around birth. Otherwise, we, we really didn't find much else. You know, we, we had like thousands and thousands of questions. Then we also kind of 
looked at ethnicity, and indeed we found that there were more Jewish uh, patients in the population, but a lot of people were non-Jewish. And also, as you see here, we, we really were not so sure if that was really true, this Jewish predisposition, because for example, there were almost no Hispanics versus the census population. Uh, and we started to believe that there were some big bias, you know, that we were not recruiting klein levin syndrome patients randomly, that maybe certain populations were more aware of klein levin syndrome. And as you know, klein levin they were two Jewish physicians, so we believe that maybe one uh, factor may have been that it was a little more known among the Jewish population. And in fact, this was also confirmed by our genetic analysis. When we started to do genetic analysis of these 108 patients, we didn't find like a piece of a chromosome that looked like from Jewish origin that would be common to all the Jewish patients. So unfortunately, that was almost like a disappointment. You know, we, we said, oh, this is not going to work. So that's what we found uh, after this study of 2008 that really it found that KLS existed really as a symptom. It had all the same symptoms as described in the literature with the periodic hypersomnia, the male, more, more men than women, usually uh, adolescent. This time we found that uh, to, to remit, it took 12 years instead of eight years. So that it's quite devastating as that means that 50% of people have the disease for eight, uh, 12 years. We also found a few genetic a few familial cases, which gave us the idea that maybe it was not a Jewish funding effect, but that maybe there were some genetic factors still. And uh, again, uh, we also did the HLA typing in everyone, and we could not confirm this uh, HLA DQ2 that had been found by Dovillier. So we saw that this autoimmune uh, idea maybe was not true. And uh, so that's when we decided, you know, in, in science, it's very important to persist. Most people, they just give up. You know, a lot of people would have said, okay, then it's going to be very difficult to find a gene because it doesn't seem that this idea of being all coming from a single or a few Jewish ancestors is correct. Then let's uh, give up. But no, we did not give up. Uh, actually, Isabel Arnuf also continued to do a lot of work, as well as other people who did a lot of imaging studies that I'm not reviewing here. But for example, she could confirm that lithium was one of the only effective treatment in very, very severe cases. So you see that uh, she took like the most severe that had a lot of episodes. And when she did put them on lithium, they were quite an improvement versus no treatment. And then finally, we come to now what we have. After a lot of patients, we continue to collect cases. And at the end, we had uh, about 700 cases, which is amazing, because I think line living is not as rare as anticipated. And what we did is a kind of a survey of the entire genome. So now it's possible to do what's called a genome-wide association. And what you do is you basically have this genetic marker that are known now because the genome is known on each chromosome. And then you kind of type all of them, then millions of little genetic differences all across the chromosome. And then basically you kind of scan the entire chromosome. And if there is a gene uh, variant that's different between cases and of KLS and controls, it will show an abnormality in statistics. You know, there will be suddenly a very high proportion of people will have a certain uh, genetic uh, marker versus the controls. And uh, that's called a genome-wide association. You can kind of go through chromosome one, chromosome two, all chromosomes. And there's millions of these markers. But one of the problems is there are millions of markers. So as a consequence, you need large numbers to find anything that makes sense. Because of course, when you compare a million of different genetic markers, if you have only five people, it doesn't mean anything. So that's why you need a very large number. And even more, you try to always replicate. But as you see, thanks to all of you, you know, and a lot of effort all across the world, in China, et cetera, we succeeded to have about 800 patients that met all the criteria. And then we did this genetic analysis over a period of 17 years. And that's what we found that was kind of very, very surprising, but very nice, is that you see here, each of these dots is kind of a genetic uh, marker. And so this on the axis is the, the 
probability of a difference between KLS and control. And because we study so many different markers, uh, you have to have a, a, a difference at least of 10 minus eight to, to know that it's actually not by chance. And as you see, this is above the threshold of chance, you know, because we compare so many markers. So all these other peaks that you see here, they could be true if we increase the sample, but right now the only one that we can be sure of is this particular uh, variance that reaches a threshold. But what was very interesting and surprising to us, it was exactly the same variant in an area of the genome that's called trunk one, which is also involved in uh, Klein living in a bipolar disorder. So that's what I'm showing here. You know, this is a, uh, um, a genome wide association, same thing that was done in both schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And you saw, see that this trunk one is exactly the same uh, signal. And in fact, if you compare, it's, it's not only in the same region, but it's exactly the same genetic change. So the same genetic change increases the risk of Klein living dramatically and increase a little bit the risk of, of bipolar disorder and a tiny bit the risk of schizophrenia. So you see, uh, for, for Klein living, it increases the risk about 50%, which is quite significant. Whereas for uh, bipolar disorder, it's now it's actually the actual number is more like 118, 18%. And for schizophrenia, 1.08%. So a very tiny effect, but it's still the exact same SNP. Maybe by the way, some people with schizophrenia or bipolar misdiagnose and are truly have Klein-Levin syndrome, it's possible. And the second thing we found that was very interesting is we found that the people with this particular genetic variant were the same people who reported have had, had problems during their births. You know, I told you that one of the things we discovered early on is a lot of patients with Klein-Levin syndrome, when you look at their past medical history, they often had a difficult birth. They were born you know, premature, or had very long labor, or had anoxia. And what was really interesting is we found that the ones that has that genetic marker seem to also be the one that had this abnormal difficulties in, in birth. And this was actually reported. And we even found that uh, it seems to have been more of a factor for the older patient with KLS. Like, for example, the people who were born in 1987 or before, there's a very strong genetic effect of, of TRANK. But then in the year 2000, there is almost no effect. And the reason is simple, is that now, you know, in the 1987, you know, a lot of people had, had the, the perinatal care was not as good as now. So a lot of people were born with difficult births because, you know, medicine has made a lot of progress. So we think that's why this association with strength is kind of decreasing because now we have more and more uh, better care around uh, births. And uh, that's why it decreases this interaction with, uh, with the trunk one polymorphism. But still it gives us a pathway maybe to look because what we believe is what's happening is that maybe when you have this particular genetic factor, if you have a difficult birth, probably it produce a lesion or there is a part of the brain that doesn't recover as well. And then later on, when you are born, uh, when you are older, you develop klein living syndrome and maybe sometime bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. And uh, of course, trying to understand what happened around birth with this particular gene could really tell us exactly which neurons or which particular uh, brain region is really important for klein levin syndrome. And that maybe needs to be fixed in the future. So we are very excited about this particular finding. By the way, we actually found that it's very reproducible. So this was a, what's a genetic load of the first patients with klein levin syndrome. And then when we took a second sample of 170, we could actually reproduce exactly the same result. So it's a very strong finding. Klein levin clearly has a lot of genetic uh, predisposition, and one of these genes is trunk one, but we don't have enough to find the other one. But when we did a pathway, we also found that some of the genes that seems to predispose statistically, none of them as a single one was significant, like trunk one. But as a group, it seems that a lot of the other gene had to do with circadian rhythm. You know, your internal body clock. 
So that's why now we believe that there's probably a combination of both this strength one bipolar-like kind of uh, birth defect problem, plus some circadian predisposition. And I will tell you how it works. Um, so uh, circadian rhythm, we believe are important for, for uh, KLS because uh, also there have been reports that maybe during Klein Levin syndrome episode, some people have very abnormal rhythm. Like this is a normal 24 hours rhythm, you know, like when you every day you, are, you move during the day and then you sleep during the night. So you see the dark bars. And this is an episode of Klein Levin syndrome. But look what happens. It's very odd. This patient, it's one particular patient. It's not sure that all patients do the same thing. But one patient, this particular patient, during the time if he had Klein Levin syndrome, instead of staying, in, staying into a 24 hour day, he started to have 25 or 26 hours days so that he kind of every day, he would go to bed later and later and later. What we believe is that that indicates that the circadian clock of people with Klein Levin syndrome doesn't work really perfectly. It's not like perfectly aligned to 24 hours. And maybe during normal time, that doesn't really matter. But during episodes, because people sleep all the time, that may actually make them kind of have a, a very abnormal uh, circadian pattern that makes even the episode last longer. And uh, that leads me to introduce this concept of proteins. Uh, we, you know, as, as I mentioned a little bit, you know, a lot of people were doing genetic for many, many years. But now there is more and more people who are interested in proteins. And the reason is that proteins is what's produced by genes. You know, the genes produce the proteins and the proteins are really what change your body. It's what is your body is made of. So for example, I, I mean, if you have, uh, you know, uh, I could give you an example, like if you have high cholesterol, there is an enzyme that's called HMG co-reductase that produce cholesterol. And if you, you can have genetic changes in, the, uh, in this gene that makes you more active or less active and have more or less cholesterol. And then having more cholesterol, which is a little bit the equivalent of what's produced by the protein, makes you more at risk of cardiovascular disease. And we know that the gene produces a risk of increased cardiovascular disease if you produce a gene that has a variant that produce more cholesterol. But of course, cholesterol is also changed by what you eat. So really the cholesterol is much closer to the cardiovascular problem than the gene. It's just that the gene tells you that cholesterol is important. So proteins is really much closer to the cause of the disease because it can be modified by both genes and environment. So we, but before recently, it was not possible to analyze all the proteins in the body like you can analyze all the genes. But now there are new technology where you can actually measure thousands of proteins. There is about 30,000 proteins in the body. There is about, as I, uh, you know, 30,000 genes that produce 30,000 proteins. And there are new techniques that can measure thousands of them at once. And it's amazing what you can do. Like for example, measuring thousands of protein, we can actually use a statistical model that can deduce the age of people. So for example, this is the actual age of many, many people and we did their protein panels. And then there are certain proteins that increase with age, others that decrease with age. And we use a, a statistical models that predict their age. And as you see, it's quite amazing. Like with a panel of protein, you can kind of predict if someone has, is you know 90 years old or is like five years old with quite high accuracy. You know? So of course, this gives us the hope that this can be used for many other things. And for example, we can actually also find proteins that predict uh, the circadian abnormalities of people pretty well, because there are proteins that can have a peak at different times of the day. So we think that by measuring proteins, we can tell if people live in Tokyo time or live in California time. And uh, that led us to also try to see if this protein could differentiate people with Klein Levin or, or uh, controls. And what we did is we took this was with an old panel. So it's only 1,000 protein. Now we can measure 7,000 protein. And then we had 20 cases and 40 controls. And it's always important in these cases to first test in one sample and reproduce your result in the second sample. 
So that's called the training court and then the validation court. So we had these 22 cases and 41 call to just train a model to find if we could predict if people like can live in syndrome, like predict age, and then confirm in a completely independent sample. And same with serum. And I'm going to pass this, but this is a complicated graph, but it's a graph that shows how predictive it is. So basically this is the number of people who uh, the specificity and sensitivity is basically when you randomly take people and do the test, how many are going to have Klein living, you predict having Klein living, you have Klein living. And the other direction is how many you predict that don't have Klein living, don't have Klein living. And really, the perfect will be if you were here. If the curve was going here, that would be 100% with the test, you could differentiate all cases from all controls. If you were just to have a straight line here. As you see with the training, it's pretty good actually because the, the, the maximum you can get of the surface is one, is one and we have 0.98. So it means that with the training, we could differentiate quite well all the patients with client living with their CSF versus controls. And then more interestingly, because you never get excited about one result, is when we replicated it, it was not as good with the next sample but still we found almost as good of a predictor. So we are very excited about that because it seems like with a CSF and measuring 1000 protein, we kind of can differentiate patient with KLS and control. So serum was also, were also worked. It was not as good, but still, you know, you see it's close to one. So that's, that's a very predictive. That means that we could really distinguish quite well patient with Klein living versus control. And even what medicine does feel even more good about it is that we could use the protein of the serum and test them in the CSF and it worked. It still predicted Klein Levin syndrome, not as well, but it seems to work. So I, we really feel quite good that it seems to uh, predict maybe the Klein Levin syndrome, uh, uh, syndrome problem. And we, we looked at where the protein come from, and this will be a long story, but basically they come from the brain. So proteins that differentiate Klein living from control. So it kind of fits. So that's where we are. I mean, I think our research has shown that Klein living is a unique disease entity. You know, it's very clear, it evolved a certain way. We know it's a real disease. Uh, then we have this very nice result in genetic now. We are starting to show some real genetic association the most exciting is trank one, but there's also this role of circadian genes and probably we need to do more, but if, I know it's very difficult because Klein living is really rare. Uh, and we think that this trunk one plus burst difficulty is one way we should pursue, try to understand what trunk one does around uh, burst on the brain and maybe on which cell it acts. And that could give us which uh, area of the brain needs to be fixed. And then we have this pilot study with this protein, which seems to suggest that there are certain proteins that are disturbed in Klein living syndromes that can be used as a diagnostic. And that could be very exciting. Uh, so right now, what we want to do uh, is to confirm that the circadian uh, issues are very important because I've started to tell my patients to take melatonin and to be very strict about their time uh, in bed. And I have the feeling, but maybe it's it's a bias that it's helping some of my patients uh, to be very strict and take melatonin and wake up always at the same time. Uh, so we want to do this active graphy study. That's what Andrea will, will talk to you about. And then we will extend the genetic study. And then we want to also do this proteomic study, but with even a bigger sample of proteins to see if we can differentiate, diagnose patients basically with a single blood test. So that's it. And I want to thank the Klein Living Foundation and of course, all the, the patients and also uh, all the staff and everybody else that has worked with me over, over time. So I think uh, maybe we should go straight to, I hope I was not too long, but we should, uh, do you want to ask questions? So should we go straight to uh, maybe um, uh, Andrea who can kind of explain now the actual study we are doing? Yeah, I think that would be great. Fantastic. I will go ahead and start the screen share after Dr. Minou. 
Oh, so sorry, stop share. Great. Awesome. Well, I'm really happy to, to kind of present today and join on after uh, Emmanuel or Dr. Munoz's um, kind of wonderful history with the foundation and with understanding the disorder. It's it's really an honor to kind of jump off of the, the springboard that um, he has created. So I will hopefully be able to share my screen here shortly. Let's see. All right. Are you guys seeing it okay? Yeah. Great. Fantastic. So kind of building off of the background that uh, Dr. Munoz so nicely set off, uh, the KLS or the, the actigraphy study that we're working on is really founded off of the hypothesis that KLS may involve a bipolar-like proteomic subtype that may interact with this rest activity disruptions in episode uh, that could help explain some of the hypersomnia. And the specific aims of this project are first to identify objective sleep and circadian biomarkers of KLS both between and within episodes, as well as establish the proteomic biomarkers of KLS and KLS subtypes, and correlate these findings above um, by the trunk one genotypes to help identify subtypes of KLS. So the actigraphy study that we're um, now conducting is aiming to recruit a total of 200 uh, patients with KLS. And so that includes a formal KLS diagnosis or express episodic hypersomnia or KLS-like symptoms uh, assessed by our research staff. And the key part of this is that they really need to be experiencing the episodes uh, relatively recently. So between they're having their last episode uh, between 12 and 18 months or within 12 or 18 months. We're also looking to recruit some healthy controls uh, to act as a, a comparison group. Um, so these healthy controls will hopefully be recruited or recommended by the, the potential participants and they'll be either relatives or friends that are um, ideally age and sex matched and must not have a diagnosis of either uh, KLS or bipolar disorder. So in terms of the study commitment, we've kind of talked about two different uh, wings of this study. So the first piece is the genetic and proteomic study, which is kind of the entry point uh, to the actigraphy study. And in terms of what this actually looks like uh, for the genetic and proteomic study, which is kind of the, the introduction and, and smallest component, um, we ask that the KLS participants uh, invite a healthy control to participate as well, and both the KLS and healthy controls would provide their medical history, um, more information about their KLS episodes, as well as uh, a history of birth questionnaires, and that's relating to the findings of the birth difficulties that Dr. Mignot had presented on earlier. We'll also ask them to, to give a blood sample, which will allow us to look both at the genetic markers, including TRANK1, as well as the proteomic uh, markers that Dr. Mignot presented on additionally. And if that's um, kind of the, the activity of choice, you can participate just in that proteomic study, and that would kind of wrap up your contribution. Uh, if you're also interested in participating in the actigraphy study, we would provide a wristwatch actigraph, which is kind of like a Fitbit, uh, and we would have you wear this for a duration of about two years. And so this rich wristwatch would sync kind of continuously just as, as a Fitbit or an Apple watch would do and provide information about your nightly sleep, heart rate, daily steps, and other features um, that can be used for your benefit as well as to the study analysis. And so this device would need to be recharged about every five to six days and synced about one to two times a week. And the good thing is uh, participants will get to keep the, the wristwatch um, even after the completion of the study. So in addition to collecting that wristwatch actigraphy, we'd also collect information about kind of sleep, mood, and lifestyle habits throughout the, the th two years. And that would be about every three months. And that would just be questionnaires that you could fill out either by your phone or through a computer. And then additionally, we're also hoping to collect information about uh, the KLS episodes themselves. So when um, you or your loved one would go into episode, you would reach out to us and we'd ask you to fill out a brief form to tell us a little bit more information about what that episode would look like. So the significance and kind of hopeful benefit of this study is that by utilizing this long-term actigraphy recording of the rest activity 
the rest activity patterns, both in and out of episode, we hope to uncover potential um, circadian mechanisms that might be contributing to KLS. And through this, uh, together with the proteomic and genetic findings, they also hold the potential to provide an objective diagnostic tool for KLS and hopefully to identify early predictors of episode onset, uh, which we could then use to hopefully intervene early. So that's just a brief summary of the study. Um, if you are interested in participating, I just wanted to share the contact information for, for Mateo Lopez, um, who's the wonderful research assistant who's running the study, uh, and then also provide the link here uh, in case you're interested as well. And we, can, we would be happy to send out any additional information um, or ads about the study if that would be helpful and address any questions here as well. And I will end with that. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank yeah, you both. You. Uh, Dr. Mignot and Dr. Goldstein and Tarski for that uh, both you know, comprehensive and, and clear review of your work in layman's terms that we can all understand here. Um, can I just follow up uh, on that last point that you um, mentioned, Dr. Goldstein and Dr. Tarski? The, when someone emails uh, Mateo in the lab to get involved, um, what exactly would, would happen beyond that? You know, once there is this, you know, communication, how does one actually participate, get the blood sample to you? What, how, did, how does it actually work? I'll actually let Mateo jump on and, and share because he's kind of uh, knows the most nitty gritty details of the process if, if he's willing to, to share. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you. Um, Hello everyone, uh, it's been introduced. I'm the research coordinator uh, heading up these two projects. So the starting off point is to ask that you either please email me directly or follow that link that we've provided to complete an initial intake form. So we will provide the consent form and all the information regarding the study procedures as well as what to expect um, for you to review. And then after we answer all your questions, we would then invite you to sign the consent form if you to the genetic and proteomic study, if you're a first time participant. And we would be communicating almost entirely through uh, email uh, correspondence because we, it's everything's done remotely. So you just have to complete all the questionnaires and I'm available by phone or by email to answer questions and also have to schedule times for Zoom calls. So after we get you enrolled in the first study, you will complete a few, uh, a comprehensive questionnaire. We'll assess if you meet the study criteria for uh, donating a blood sample. And if you are invited to donate a blood sample, uh, I would then send out a shipment uh, containing a blood kit and instructions for you to take with you to a local clinic, uh, blood draw uh, clinic or your physician, and just at your earliest convenience, take a blood, have your blood sample be taken, and then send that materials that we would provide for you. Um, and when we pay for the, all the shipping costs as well. Um, so that's the initial out of episode sample. If you are also willing uh, and you agree, we would send you a second blood sample kit that you are free to store and then use if it comes up, uh, if the opportunity comes up in the event that uh, your loved one experiences a KLS episode, then if you are able to, uh, then you would get the blood draw, uh, the blood draw taken um, during the episode and then send it back using the same way. But accepting to receive an additional blood sample kit is by no means an obligation um, for you to donate that additional blood sample. We wanna make sure that that's clear that everything is completely voluntary and that we're here to support you um, in any way that we can. Um, so that's for the first uh, part of the study. 
Now, if you are interested in participating in the actigraphy study, then we would kind of go through the, repeat the same process of sharing the information about the study, enrolling you online, and then asking you to complete a few questionnaires in the beginning, uh, kind of assessing the initial information, and then we would send you a dictigraphy uh, wristband. Uh, now, if you're a first-time participant, we might uh, squeeze the, those two pieces together. So we would send you the blood sample kit and the dictigraphy wristband uh, at the same time uh, so that you only have to worry about one uh, shipment uh, arriving for you. Yep, I think that almost all of it from my end. Okay, are we are we able to have non-US participants in, in the study uh, at this point? Yes. So for the genetic study, we are available to uh, recruit and enroll international participants. Uh, and for the actigraphy study, as of right now, we're only able to enroll uh, US participants, but we're looking to see if we are able to expand that for uh, UK patients um, due to a potential uh, connection uh, with Dr. Guy Leshner's group and the support of the uh, Support KLS UK Foundation. Yeah. I, I think you mentioned, Dr. Uh, Goldstein, in your remarks that you're, you're shooting for 200 patients for the actigraphy study. Um, is that the same number, Dr. Mignot, that you need? How many samples do you need to advance both the genetic study um, to further your understanding on TRANK1 and other markers, and then also the proteomic study? Is that the same number, or is it a different number that you think you need? So there's two, uh, two yeah. Uh, first, I, I also wanted to briefly answer another question about melatonin. Some people have asked what melatonin is. is Melatonin is basically, uh, uh, there are two things that helps uh, to make sure that your circadian clock stays in line with the daytime. One is to make sure that you expose yourself to light, outside light. You know, that's why, you know, people experience jet lag, especially if people go into a dark room, et cetera, or, or don't go outside. So being outside during the daytime hours is probably very important to, to keep your circadian rhythm aligned with a 24-hour day. And melatonin is an is a hormone that helps to synchronize your rhythm because it's a dark signal. It's what you secrete during the dark, so it's 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 the equivalent of light, but it signals darkness. It's a little bit less powerful than light, but still it helps to synchronize your rhythm. So another way to synchronize your rhythm instead of getting a lot of light during the day is to take melatonin at night, every night, a 0.3 milligram. Uh, 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 an hour before going to bed. Um, so regarding the samples uh, that we have, uh, we have uh, we have some old samples that we hope that we'll be able to to use. But the problem is that the new the newest platform we would prefer to get newer sample. So our plan is really to first test the old sample we have, uh, knowing it's not perfect because it was not using the exact a type of anticoagulant that the company likes to use for this proteomic assay. It still works, but it's not perfect. But we still have cases, we still have some good sample that we want to try because we think uh, otherwise it's going to take too long to gather all the samples, new samples. So basically, we're at the same time we are testing these old samples that we want to do as soon as possible. We are also going to to gather new sample with a slightly better anticoagulant as the actigraphy study is uh, you know, collecting more samples. So to answer the question in brief, no, we don't need the new sample to do the proteomics. We are going to do it in the old sample. It's 95% okay. I mean, I think we'll get the same result. Uh, in fact, we use all sample for the, for the data that I showed you. But at the same time, now we are gathering uh, samples with a slightly better anticoagulant for the future. But I think it's probably going to take several years before we have you know, a new sample with that anticoagulant. 
One thing I wanted to say also about the proteomic, which is nice, is it also allows to test the circadian uh, phase. So we can also see if the patient with Klein-Levin syndrome have a normal circadian kind of uh, phase uh, as well. So not only we can kind of try to distinguish patients with KLS from controls, but also we can see if using other proteins, if the circadian clock is normal. Thank you. Um, there's a question here um, about your the Trank one paper. Um, it references the last KLS conference um, and recalls that at that time of the conference that the paper had been submitted but had not yet been published um, given a view from reviewers that it wasn't a significant sample. Uh, the question here is how is the medical community embracing and supporting, you know, such research studies and publication of, of your significant work, given that it is uh, an orphan disease? Yes. So one problem, of course, with, with the study like uh, the Klein-Levin syndrome study is that it's, I know it sounds crazy, but as they say, it's too small of a sample. Because, you know, like if you look at Alzheimer, now they are testing 40,000 people with Alzheimer's disease. So obviously, when you say that you're coming, oh, I'm coming with 600 Klein Levin syndrome, even so it's kind of amazing. You know, people just think it's a small sample. Uh, but that's really all what we can do. Um, uh, I think... Uh, so that, that did produce some, some difficulties in publishing because a small sample are always harder to publish. Um, but, you know, uh, I feel quite confident about the results uh, myself. And I think most people as well in the medical community. Now there is also a lot of interest actually in bipolar disorder about the relationship between birth difficulties and, and the risk of bipolar and schizophrenia. So in fact, it's, it's coming at a time where everyone is interested in that general area. So I should also mention that it's very possible that I am trying to work with the bipolar community to try to replicate what we found with KLS and birth difficulty in bipolar, to see if the gene with bipolar, that, since the same genetic factor predisposed to bipolar, is that also the bipolar or schizophrenia cases that have had birth difficulty that have this association. So we are trying to do that. And I just gave a talk to the what's called the Psychiatry Genomic Consortium, PGC, that has like several thousands of patients with bipolar to try to see if they could look at the same things in the bipolar sample. Uh, so I think it has stimulated a lot of interest even outside of, of just Klein-Levin syndrome. And I think that can only be of benefit to you because it's likely to be a little bit of a similar mechanism, even so the effect in Klein Levin is much stronger again than bipolar. And I just want to make sure you, you all realize that, of course, we know that bipolar and Klein Levin are different. You know, it's just one share particular genetic factor. Um, I don't know, I hope I answered the question. You did, thank you. Um, can I switch gears here? Um, we received a lot of questions um, ahead of time, all related to, to COVID, like I mentioned uh, to you earlier before we had the conversation, um, unsurprisingly. So a lot of people were asking the questions on whether you thought COVID could trigger uh, a KLS episode and what your thoughts were there. And then also questions about um, taking the vaccine and what the risks around uh, taking the, the COVID vaccine were? So first, I, I want to say that, you know, I mean, I unfortunately, I don't have all the answers. I wish I would have all the answers. So I can't really talk about, you know, uh, individual cases. It's very difficult to tell. We know that Klein-Levin syndrome episodes are often triggered by all kinds of strange things, like drinking a little bit too much, you know. Uh, and as I mentioned, by the way, you know, it looks like uh, the circadian factors are especially important when you start to become sick. 
I really believe that probably you, you know, what happened in KLS is you start to have a problem and then maybe you start to sleep a little bit too much during the day. And then once you start to sleep too much into the day, you don't have enough light and your circadian clock length then becomes uh, desynchronized from the real world. And then that makes it even worse. So in my opinion, the circadian factors are probably not the initial cause of KLS, but maybe maintaining the episodes for longer. That's just my hypothesis. And that's one of the things we're going to try to discover with uh, Andrea. Um, so, um, so I don't think, I mean, it's, if you get sick with a COVID vaccine, I think it's always possible it could trigger an episode. So same way as drinking too much or having another cold will trigger an episode. But I don't think there's anything special about COVID or the COVID vaccines that makes it especially nasty to people with Klein-Levin syndrome. Does it okay. answer the question? Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. And, that's, that's, um, that's our PSA to go get vaccinated. Yes. Right. Yeah. No. Of course, you should all get vaccinated. I was vaccinated, and you know, I think Andre Andreas was vaccinated as well. But it's true that some people have had side effects, and uh, you know, I, 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 the only advice I will give is again, as I kind of try to hint is maybe when you get sick is to make sure that you still go outside to get light. Someone talk about light therapy. It's as important as melatonin. And the melatonin doesn't need to be given as five hours before. In this particular case, I think you can take it, you know, one hour before bedtime. But what's very important is to take the 0.5 milligram, you know, like or 0.3 milligram, because a lot of the melatonin that's sold in the stores is like three or five milligram, which is 10 times the normal physiological dose. So it's almost like if you were flooding your entire, you know, body with melatonin for days. So you really should use only the lower dose melatonin, 0.3 or 0.5 milligram, and about one hour before bedtime. And taking it regularly and in the morning, getting a lot of good light, is a light therapy after you wake up or going outside, I think that would help to anchor your, your circadian rhythm. And it is true that if someone is starting to be sick, probably it's useful to try to maintain it. But I know it might be impossible because I, I, you know, I know Klein Levin as well as you do. And I know that it's sometimes impossible to even move people. So it's not like I'm trying to give you advice, knowing that, that they may not be easy to follow. But uh, I think it's something that could make a difference. And, and I think another thing I want to mention is Andrea mentioned that it's likely that Klein Living is not 100% exactly the same thing. So of course, something could work with one person, but not another. Speaking to that, um, we received a couple of questions about the, the self-limiting nature of KLS. Um, one, question that came in was um, a, a caregiver who has, um, you know, a son who has had KLS now for, you know, nearly 11 or 12 years. And the question is on the potential for full recovery. Um, as, you know, many patients, myself included, um, have grown out of the condition after roughly a 10 year period. So can you speak to um, you know, what you've observed in your research about the, the self-limiting nature of KLS versus perhaps some atypical cases that continue to last longer in, into adulthood and, and beyond those years in life? First, I, I of course, again, the, there's no rule in medicine, you know, it's kind of the, it's also always a problem is you have general things, but there are always exceptions. And uh, I mean, I, I think Danny is one of them. He had, for example, very long episodes, if I remember well, which are above, you know, what's usually observed. Usually it's like three weeks and, and uh, some, and, but some people have it much, much longer. And the same way, you know, some of cases of Klein Levin, it continues much later in life. There is also a notion that's, I think, quite well supported now by the literature 
that when you do brain scan, and it's not something I've discussed because I don't do this, but a lot of people have done brain scan of activity of the brain when you are in Klein-Levin syndrome episode. And what you see is versus when you are outside of an episode, your brain has patches of areas that seems to be decreased in activity, like which could explain why people are kind of in a second, kind of in a, in a daze during episodes. And the region that seems to be the most affected are the thalamus and some pieces of the cortex. And um, what's interesting is that people have, have also looked at group differences between everyone with KLS versus everyone without KLS. And what they are finding is there are still differences between episodes. Even when people are normal, there's still like that same pattern, but not as strong as in episodes. Does it make sense? And even after people have recovered, there is some suggestion that that pattern persists. So there are some people who believe that when you have KLS, you never really completely recover, that you compensate for it well, but that maybe it's still kind of there, but somehow it doesn't manifest itself. Um, I just want, and so maybe some cases just don't completely reverse themselves. Um, but I would say that the large majority of cases that I've seen, they eventually get better. I mean, of course, it's a bit hard because, uh, you know, we lose patients after 10 years. I mean, it's not, it's not easy to keep following those patients for 10 years, but everything when people have looked, it, it looks like people do get better. So a lot, very large majority. But again, there is this, oh, by the way, it's interesting with the proteomics, we found the same thing is in the sample of, we had a few sample of people in episode. Can you imagine? I know it's, I'm not asking anyone to do that, but we actually had blood sample or CSF sample of a few patients while they are episodes. And the proteomic score was even higher, you know, like if they were more KLS, but still, even the people that were outside of episodes still had that abnormality. So again, there is a feeling that in KLS, there is an abnormality all through that maybe persists even longer after KLS is done, but somehow it, it gets compensated, you know, and then sometimes there's this breakthrough. And then when you're older, somehow you learn to compensate for it. So those that still are um, experiencing episodes later on, is there anything that you would encourage to those in our community that are having these, this atypical experience? Is there anything that they could they could or should be doing to, to, you know, in their lives or to learn more about their cases than they currently are aware of? Of course, there is a lot of, I mean, when we see patients with Klein-Levin syndrome, the, the main thing we do is first you, you try to decide, you know, am, am I didn't miss anything? Is that really Klein-Levin syndrome? Is it not something else that kind of, a brain disorders that I miss. And that's even my, my, that's what I'm always scared of, even personally, you know? And a lot of doctors are very scared because they don't know, so they are not so sure they want to give the Klein Levin syndrome diagnosis. Once you see a lot, I think you get more familiar with it. And you, even so, you cannot be 100% sure. I mean, maybe there is something else going on. Uh, but I think you, you get more confident that it really looks like KLS, even so, there is, of course, some variation. The second thing is I usually tell people to get their rhythm, you know, now because of this finding to, to really have very um, uh, regular, try to get a regular life. I have the feeling it makes a difference, but I, I'm not sure because it's only a few patients I've tried. Uh, again, to maybe consolidate your rhythm and, and, and get light during the day and, and take melatonin during the, the night. I think helps. Someone asked about vitamin D3. I don't think we have really uh, tested it, so I don't know. Uh, and then the big decision is whether or not people could, could benefit from lithium. In most cases, if people don't have very severe cases, I, I have the tendency to more accommodate, you know, try to figure out the ways that they learn about the disease, that they understand it, that we communicate with the teachers, with everyone, so that when there is an episode, one, people don't hurt themselves 
because there have been a few cases of people like driving and killing themselves. There have been a case of someone choking on food. So you really want to make sure that there is uh, some kind of family support or some support around KLS and, and also that there is some accommodation if people can go to school, etc. And then if it's really serious, then you use lithium. And the experience is that in 50% of the cases, it would decrease the, the episodes quite significantly, more than 50% of the cases. But lithium has a lot of side effects, so it's a little bit difficult to take that decision. We received several questions on, on medications. Um, in addition to lithium, the questions we're asking um, whether there's anything new that patients could, could try that you're aware of or um, things that they have tried already, but either were ineffective or the side effects were, were too great, um, whether or not there is a reason to repeat and try things that they have uh, already done so in the past. It's a very tough question because um, um, there is no evidence when we looked that other mood regulators, you know, beside lithium, people sometimes use less kind of strong, you know, mood, reg mood stabilizer. So they are like anti-epileptic drugs that have been used. Like some of them have a, uh, one second, I need to close the door because it's a bit. This is a problem of being home. I don't have your adorable daughters jumping, you know. <laughs> Wasn't a prop, I promise. Okay. Um, but uh, yes, so I think maybe some of the mood stabilizer, you know, it, it has been tried many times and usually it doesn't work, but I still feel that there are new ones maybe that would be worth maybe trying, that maybe have not been tried enough and maybe have effect occasionally. I still have trouble to understand why it works in bipolar and not at all in Klein-Levin syndrome because the data suggests that it's only lithium that works. But um, so I think in cases you could still try, but the data is not very is not supportive. Someone has tried uh, also steroids because there is the idea that maybe there is some degree of inflammation. By the way, I should mention that one thing we found in the CSF of patients with Klein-Levin syndrome is there were more protein, which is a sign of breakdown of blood-brain barrier. So maybe there is a little bit of inflammation as well. Not autoimmune, but just inflammation, which we don't understand. And which goes with a lot of disease process, you know, that can be... Uh, so... Um, uh, um, Isabel Arnuf has tried uh, IV uh, steroids and has shown that in some cases it seemed to work, but I'm really worried about it because IV steroids sometimes can have really uh, serious side effects. Uh, in particular, it's very rare, but it can produce like a, a necrosis of one of the bone of the hip. Uh, and so I uh, I, I really don't feel like it's justified to use high dose steroids like that. And I don't have experience for it. So uh, with it, um, we, we thought about using ketamine I, because I'm sure you have heard that now there is a lot of data about trying to use ketamine uh, for depressive episodes. And I don't know if some of you have tried. We, we, I, I know of a couple of uh, two people we have uh, we have tried and that didn't really do anything, but I'm I'm still hoping that more people would try during episodes because you know some of it is intranasally, so it's not very difficult to take, and maybe it could interrupt some episodes. So I, I think it'd be worth trying because it's safe and why not? But I I mean the result to date have not been very positive. I don't know if the foundation has heard more than what I've heard. I think anecdotally, it's it's very similar. Uh, we've heard of a few cases of, of people trying it um, with varying doses and various you know ways of of getting it into your body without without much benefit. Okay. 
So at least that's a good... Uh, I mean, sometimes not working is better in some ways because, you know, regularly what I, we hear from the KLS community, it's very difficult because sometimes there's one person that says, oh, I've tried thyroid hormones or I eat a yogurt in the full moon and then my KLS episode was completely cured. But what's difficult is that KLS is so capricious. You know, sometimes the disease stops after several years. Sometimes it lasts much longer. Uh, and the episodes themselves, sometimes they are short, sometimes they are long. So, of course, a lot of these things can happen completely by luck. And um, it makes it really hard to, uh, to really know if these things are true. Uh, and often when they are checked, they are not true, unfortunately. Mm. So regularly I hear, I mean, of course, I'm always happy to listen to to what patients say and i think there is value i mean that's how we found for example that lithium seems to be more effective than other drugs we analyzed everything in the literature and we found that when you really analyze everything in the literature only lithium had some evidence of effect okay we're, we're a few questions have uh come in here um on the cause and effects of KLS one, uh, a few in email uh, before the call, but I see that a few people are asking now about uh, migraines um, and are suggesting that uh, the patients uh, are experiencing migraines and wondering if there's any sort of association or connection that you're aware of between having migraine headaches and, and KLS. So I think it's more like a differential diagnosis than, than anything is that some if people have migraine, migraine can have a lot of different manifestation. I mean, usually it lasts only three days, but you can have a lot of neurological problem associated with migraine. You can even sometimes have neurological symptoms. So you have a lot of atypical form of migraines. But I guess if it's a migraine, you know that uh, treatment with a triptan, you know, like imitrax or something, really is usually quite effective especially the injectable. So I, I think, uh, you know, when it's migraine, it's, it's different from KLS. But I think it's an important differential diagnosis that you have to always consider. But usually it doesn't last long as long. Uh, in terms of um, uh, association with headache, yes, uh, headache is a common co-occurrence. And uh, I mean, we really don't know anything about the mechanism. Uh, of course, if there is a headache that's very, very uh, severe, and if you have uh, other symptoms like nausea, or photophobia, sometimes that can suggest that the patient has uh, um, meningitis, which then requires a lumbar puncture to make sure that you don't make a wrong diagnosis. So in fact, headache always worries me a little bit in the context of KLS, because I always think that it could be something more severe than KLS but it does occur in about, I think, 18% of the cases. Okay, another question was on the connection between anxiety and KLS. Um, is there any research uh, between anxiety uh, or PTSD uh, for KLS? So we, we did find in one of our study that that's the only thing that the patient with KLS had a slightly higher score of anxiety measuring a scale that's called GAD, which measures just generalized anxiety versus controls, but it was not a big effect. So it's possible that, again, that it could be one of the triggering factor. Uh, however, you know, anxiety is usually can be treated with SSRI, for example, like SSRI very often have a positive effect on anxiety. Uh, it's one of the way you can treat generalized anxiety, but I've never seen SSRI have any effect on KLS. I mean, this has been like reported by hundreds of people and I've tried myself, I've never seen any effect. So I, I think anxiety could be like, it's very difficult to know if it's secondary to having KLS. I mean, it's not a nice life to have KLS or if it's just also maybe a co-occurrence that's a little bit, you know, every disease has some other symptoms. Uh, we are uh, including the mood and anxiety questionnaires for the actigraphy study, which will be collected long term as well. So hopefully we'll be able to kind of look longitudinally to see how um, those symptoms relate to the KLS episodes as well. 
Yes, and it's the same for mood. I mean, typically patients with, with uh, KLS are not depressed, but it is true that sometimes, you know, I mean, if you have KLS, it's just not a nice life. I mean, they get desperate and they feel so bad during episodes. Sometimes, I mean, someone mentioned hallucinations. It is sometimes they have very dreamlike hallucinations, they have REM sleep and er eruptions, they have all kinds of issues. And sometimes they're just tired of having episodes after episodes. So it's very difficult sometimes to see if it's cause or consequence. And again, it could even be that, I mean, depression sometimes it's almost organic. I mean, you know, sometimes it's reactional, you know, people lose very close people and you really know there is a good cause, but sometimes it comes out of the blue and it's almost like a disease, like an infection. And so maybe there is some common a network of, of neurons and things that are similar and that explain also the reactivity with lithium. So of course we are interested in trying to, to look at this relationship and we are going to try to collect more data. Um, but in general, again, I mean, I, I think when we really look, we don't see a, a, a big association with depression. Okay. What about diet? We, we received some questions on that too. Um, is there anything that patients should be aware of and think about in terms of making dietary changes that may uh, impact their health? I don't have a, I don't know much about it. I mean, the same way as in narcolepsy or so forth, I have this patient who tell me, oh my God, I went onto a keto diet and I was totally cured. I, I didn't have any more, but it's just like one off and it's very difficult to know if it's chance, if it's true in one patient, uh, because I think we all have to be honest, you know, everyone is different and there are things that could work in one patient, but that are impossible to prove. Uh, and I mean, the only thing I would say is that if diet has an effect on client living, the, the best way would be to be on and off the diet and really see that it relapses, which is very difficult to do. Uh, but I, I haven't seen any evidence that diet kind of influence clean living. As for everything else, I would say that if you change abruptly your diet, you have to be cautious that it could trigger an episode because I, I just always have the feeling that episodes are triggered by so many different things that you just have to keep this possibility in mind. That being said, you know, uh, you know, we have to live, we all have to live a life. So uh, I, you just have to keep that in mind. Okay. Steve, I don't know if there's been any other questions. Um, have you, you seen the chat? I think you've been, uh, you've been hitting most of them uh, as we've been going through, so. Okay. Um, there was one other question on, um, regulating your emotions uh, and how that may play into some of the symptoms of KLS, uh, specifically the derealization, um, the loss of reality and paranoia. Is there anything you can speak to uh, about regulating your emotions and, and what impact they may or may not have? I, I think sleep is the best remedy. I mean, trying to sleep as much as possible uh, until it goes away. Um, I have the feeling and then trying to stay in a familiar environment. I mean, that's the second thing that I think is important, you know, stay in your room with your parents, with, you know, in, in a place that's non-threatening. I mean, don't, don't go out, uh, you know, and also that's the problem sometimes is, some other doctors that don't know KLS, they give stimulants sometimes, they give amphetamines or, and sometimes then people with KLS become completely agitated because not only they still feel weird, but on top of that, they can sleep. And that's really the worst combination. So in general, I think sleeping is definitely uh, the, the most important. There was a question that uh, somebody just asked on, on the rebound insomnia, which, uh, Donnie, I don't know about you, but I, I always had that kind of a day or so post episode where I would not be able to sleep, uh, at least for that first night after kind of coming out of that episode. 
Yes, it is common. And in some ways, it reminds also a little bit of, of what some patients with uh, bipolar sometimes experience, you know, we, where they have a little bit of a rebound uh, after when they go out of depression. Uh, this is commonly observed for one day or two days. And it's kind of logical because people have slept so much that they will be a bit, uh, you know, and I mean, I just reassure people that it's completely normal and that it usually passes after one or two days. By the way, that's interesting. One thing that we have found is that when we measure the orexin level, so maybe some of you know that I measure I, I, one of my specialties, I, I found the cause of narcolepsy, which is due to this lack of orexin. And we measured the CSF in the CSF of patients with Klein Levin. Orexin has been measured. And every time it has been done, it has been found quite consistently that uh, orexin levels decreases when, when people are in Klein Levin syndrome. Like, we don't know if it's a cause or consequence, but uh, you know, clearly they have less of this wake promoting neurotransmitter. Uh, and uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, you know it comes back up and maybe it rebounds a little bit. You know, uh, when you, once you are done with the episode. Yeah, there there was a question. Um... Coming in, if you, if you kind of based on everything you've done now, believe that autoimmune would be ruled out as in relation to KLS? It's it's now so in the past we used to separate very well like autoimmune, infectious, neurology, but now it's much more murky because, for example, um, uh, we know that with COVID. You have all heard that some people develop stroke or develop very odd diseases. So infection can cause like all kinds of different things in the body. Similarly, and maybe that's too much of the immune response or it's the infection itself. Similarly, even for Alzheimer or Parkinson, I have another project where I've discovered that the immune system is very important to help to clear some of the plaques and the, the lesions that are produced by this uh, uh, by, by the neurodegeneration. So the immune system is also involved in like anti-Alzheimer probably. Uh, there are also evidence that uh, it's, so now there's more and more a gradient. It's not like everything is autoimmune, something uh, autoimmune. And there's probably a lot of disease that are a little bit, the immune system plays a role and or inflammation plays a role. So I think generally when you have a pure autoimmune disorder, you have this very strong signal in HLA or, and we haven't found that. So I think it's not likely that it's purely autoimmune, but it's possible that there is a role of the immune system that makes it worse, more inflammation, and that it could participate to the symptoms. So um, I really appreciate all, all the, the time and, and I know the community does. In the last uh, you know, minute or so that, that we have here scheduled, um, what, what's, what's next? What, you know, what, what can people do or what, uh, what can we hope for? What's, uh, somebody had earlier had asked, if, is there a roadmap to uh, you know, cure, cause, all those kinds of things, which I, unfortunately I don't think there is a, an easy roadmap, but um, you know, what in, your, what in your mind maybe is the next steps or the most helpful things that individuals or families can do? Oh, I think uh, definitely, uh, I'm a big believer in research. So I definitely believe in research. So I think uh, there's two different re uh, regions. I mean, first we need to understand, I think a little bit better what we, we, what we are doing in terms of understanding maybe the subtype of klein levin syndromes, the proteins that are involved in the blood that seems to correlate with the symptom. Some of them may even cause a symptom, we don't know. Once you start to measure thousands of proteins, maybe there's a subset that cause and other consequences. So doing more genetic and, and correlation with these proteins may sometimes give us at some point one gene that cause a protein that then really cause the symptoms. So that's one possibility. The second area that I, I think we need to do more work on is again, understanding the subtype and the role of the circadian rhythm as we are doing, because maybe again, monitoring better the circadian rhythm could really 
prevent, you know, we could find when the episode starts and then stop it before it starts. So that's why we are doing this study with Andreas. And then there's one more thing we don't do that I think needs to be done is to try to understand really what this trunk one does around uh, early of, uh, you know, perinatal, you know, like because we have this very odd like uh, interaction maybe with, with, uh, with uh, you know, between this trunk one ge genetic change and that birth trauma or an anoxia. And for that, I, I'm not doing it because uh, I mean, first, I'm always trying to find someone that could do it with me, but let's say that I'm not really set up in my lab to study this kind of things. Uh, there are possible, but I think I've, I'm trying to engage the people who are working uh, in, in um, bipolar and, and with this gene and trying to see if we could do something together. So that's my plan to try to uh, get someone else to <laughs> look at that for us. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's and, and I think maybe potentially we could find one group of neurons or some proteins that are really critically important. And then there might be a way then to reverse the abnormality. I mean, of course it's, I mean, I, I don't want, I'm not the kind of person that likes to give uh, uh, false hope. I, I, I mean, research is, is very long. It's unpredictable also. You never know what you're going to exactly find. I mean, for narcolepsy, I found the cause of narcolepsy 20 years ago, and now they, have, they are coming with a drug that completely reverses the symptoms of narcolepsy thanks to my discovery. I mean, for KLS, I think it's going to be more complicated, but I, I have a good feeling that we're going to learn more and more and that at some point there will be some better solutions at lithium, but it's, it's too early. And the, the results are going to also come out partially probably with a better understanding of bipolar, this trunk one genes that I think people are getting more interested in. Um, but it's impossible to give a timeline. So there is a roadmap, but I have to be honest, it's, I think it's pretty clear what we need to do now based on what we have discovered, trying to understand trunk one interaction around birth to figure out what kind of neurons are really affected and if we could fix that. Trying to find the proteins that are linked with the gene and abnormal with KLS. Is there some that could be involved in the symptoms? Could we act on them? But to tell you that the road is, these roads are going to lead to Rome, I'm not sure. Maybe there are, some of them are going to lead to the ocean and we're going to be stuck. It's impossible to tell. The only thing we, we can do is just work hard and continue to dig. Uh, but the good thing about science, and I want to point out, is that it's not just us. I mean, we are doing our best, but it's also it's amazing right now, the progress you can do. I mean, it was unthinkable that you could measure 7,500 proteins in 100 microliter of blood even five years ago. Who knows what you can do in five more years? So the other thing that's very important is to keep your ear close to the ground and kind of figure out what technique you can bring suddenly to the problem and how you can collaborate with people and, 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 and find you know, the, the next thing to do. But I think we're in the middle of a biological revolution and the key for KLS is to be on the map and be able to participate to that biological revolution. And I think right now we're doing everything that's possible. And I think we made a big progress also. I, I really want to stress that the, the trunk one finding and that genetic finding is, is really the first time that we have something really tangible. The proteomics, if we can reproduce it, because I'm really careful, you know, I, I just, we have checked it 20 times in different ways, but I still would like to reproduce it one more, one more time to make sure because I'm, but if it's true, I think it's going to lead to also some very interesting finding. So I'm very hopeful, but I can only be hopeful. I can't be certain that I'm going to be able to deliver something, that we are going to be able to deliver something. But I think we're doing the right things. That's great. Well, uh... and I want to thank the, the, the foundation too, because I also want to say that it has always been wonderful to work with people at the foundation. 
you know, I think you are all very, very engaged patients. We always, you know, you always respond to all the research. You are interested, you are knowledgeable. It's, you have a very good community as well. And the foundation has always been very effective and, and very generous. I mean, we had one NH grant, but otherwise everything we have done has been funded by, by the foundation. And I think it's 90% of what has been no, is known about KLS. So you should also congratulate you on the back. I mean, you, you seem to be very thankful to us, but you should also be thankful to yourself because you made it possible and that's not easy. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, you know, we are, we are grateful for um, the work that you have done um, and we view it similarly. Um, you are an invaluable partner to us um, and we look forward to continuing to support your efforts to, to find breakthroughs and to understand uh, what KLS is all about. We all, we all want the same thing and we will not stop until we get there. Um, so thank you very much for, for taking the time and speaking with us. And um, I hope we can reconvene in, uh, in the near future and have some, some more exciting things to speak about. Absolutely. I hope to. I, I'm always happy to, uh, to get online and talk to people and answer questions. And I'm sure it's the same for Andrea and Matteo. Yep. Thank, thank you, all of you. Thank you all so right. much. Thanks, Donnie. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.